Okay, folks, okay. Well, I told you today, is, uh, this is our special election edition, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be funky, man. That's the best I can say. And uh, I have in the house two, two, two. Both are new, man. They have all made the they've made their goal. And I'm talking about uh, Al Hassan Suhini. He's in the house. Show some love. And uh, and George Anda is in the house. They are both first timers, and uh, they are in the house. And we get the chance to hang out with them. Now, put your hands together. Show some love for the man, Al Hassan Suhini. <laughs> There you go, there you go, there you go. Alright. Put your hands together, man. Well, so we're in the house, we're gonna take a commercial break. When we come back, I bet you're dead. We'll be right back. Stay tuned, your swagalicious sugar daddy will be right back. We wish you a merry ASM show. Okay, folks. Well, this is what I love about Ghana, man. It's, it's great, man. It's great. Only in Ghana, you know, in, Jam, uh, in, Ga in Gambia, uh, President uh, Yaya Jame, he also conceded and he says, I given. And then he woke up two days later and said, Masa Madrin. But that is the beauty of Ghana, you know. Um, our president uh, conceded beautifully. And not only did he concede, he actually wore white, white to go to church to give thanksgiving to God. Said, whatever God does, we are. So he was actually in church giving thanks to God. But something interesting happened at the church, man. And uh, you, first of all, take a look at this. So there we go. We see the president and his family singing and dancing. But there's this character in the church, man. This man is dancing like crazy. And look at him. The way I look this man, man, Charlie, he's dancing too happily, man. I swear, this might be MPP, man. <laughs> look, at, look at him, just look at that, he's dancing. <laughs> and, and let me check out, let, let, let's see what the president is thinking at this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man. Well, you, you, you saw the man, man. You, you, you. I, I suspect that, man. You suspect that, man. Show some love, man. <laughs> I think the national security should be invited. This is just why we're investigating. You almost did today. Yeah. I, I, what, 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 was, what dance was that? <laughs> no. Yes, I think it's a victory dance. <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, thank you. So and uh, I was going to say the day after, but it's only the day after, mm. you know. Uh, days after the. The shocking? Were you shocked or did you expect this? What, what was your take on that? I think I was humbled by it. You were humbled? Yes. Wow. I, I, I followed it uh, to a point that I knew it was over, even though uh, some level of hope, you know, existed and mm -hmm. a few hanged on that hope. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. for some reason, I just couldn't see how that will materialize because I thought it was even going to be very difficult. I mean, what was said was that, okay, we will be minority, but we will have the executive. And yeah. I just couldn't yeah. imagine how we were going to run the country, mm -hmm. you know, with that kind of arrangement. At the point where you were, you were suspecting that perhaps uh, uh, NDC will carry the executive, but the parliamentary will be NPP, were you worried or did, did you see that that, that could have been a challenging new phase of Ghana's democracy. Yes, I thought it was going to present us with an exciting challenge. And I was fascinated by the fact that I will have a role to play in mm, that challenge mm, as mm. a minority member of parliament mm. with, you know, the president being my president. Mm, I mm. thought it was going to be fascinating. It would have, you know, opened new doors in yeah. our democratic yeah. experiment yeah. Uh, yeah. experimentation. So. I, I, I kind of relished it, but mm. I was worried for, you know, the country as a whole and mm. how difficult it was going to be. But at the point when you realize, mm -mm, I don't even think that the, exec that the executive is also losing at that point, yeah. what, what was your feeling? I felt very, very sorry for him because I thought he didn't deserve it. I thought this was a man who meant very well for this country and for his party and ha you know through his works proved it mm -hmm. you know he wasn't even complacent about the fact that he had delivered so much 
he campaigned so hard. And I remember what he said, which I believe is true, during the last rally at the stadium, mm. that we fought this election like we were in opposition. Mm. Mm. He fought it that way. Mm. Maybe not many people in the party did. Mm. But if you monitored the way he went about his activities, mm. you will see that he gave it his all. He wasn't complacent. He knew he had delivered mm -hmm. and he had worked tirelessly to achieve a lot of things that you can call monumental yeah. within the short possible time yeah. that he was president with even all the hurdles that he had you know, to jump over to achieve those things. He still went out and campaigned like he was in opposition. Mm -hmm. You know, midnight, mm -hmm. early morning, mm -hmm. He was on the move. Mm -hmm. I recall at one point he went to about 11 or 13 constituencies in one day, went to about three regions in one day, and still attended to our international you know, duties as president, attended to his duties as president, and still had that time yeah. to engage with the people, the chiefs. So I felt sorry for him. Yeah. I felt so sorry. And, 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 and on each step of the way, the crowds were magnificent. So where was the disconnect? Was there a disconnect in your analysis? Mm. What was wrong? Because the crowds were there, and he can be, like you said, like crazy, yeah. and yet the votes didn't come. So where was the disconnect? I am not one who dwells a lot on regrets. You know, I see a lot of us struggling to understand what went wrong and we are passing the bag and blaming everyone except ourselves. But we were all together in the boat and mm. if the boat has collapsed, mm. it means that each of us have a role to play. Mm. Even if you had to just draw the sailor's attention and you didn't, mm. that is a responsibility that you should bear. So I, I don't want to focus too much. Okay. I have, after that, I haven't tried to focus too much on, on what went wrong, who did what, who should have done that. I just feel that we as a whole let down a very, very hard working man who meant well for this country. And I said it before and I'll say it, he rode a beautiful horse brilliantly with all the pomp and pageantry, elegantly to the finish line, only to find out the chariot was not hooked to the horse. Wow. That's deep. Yeah. That's deep. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's sad. I mean, he, 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 he did his very best. And I don't know anyone who genuinely will, will challenge me on the fact that he worked his... Okay, I was going to use. <laughs> <laughs> he went to XSX. Yeah, he, he did. Yeah. The criticism is that well, he, all this concentration on infrastructure, infrastructure doesn't vote, yeah. and we don't eat infrastructure. Yeah. Is that is that a legitimate uh, reason, or there's some some other reason other than infrastructure doesn't vote? It is dangerous if we go on that tangent and argue that infrastructure doesn't vote, we will be setting a bad precedent for our successive governments because politicians will always take decisions based on how much votes will come their way. And so if we begin to tell them that, look, if you construct my road, it doesn't matter. If you do a good school in my community that my children will attend, it doesn't matter. If you fix the hospital, it doesn't matter. If you increase generation capacity of power, that will lead to creation of jobs through industry. It doesn't matter. Then we will be asking our politicians to do other things that will not serve this country well. And so it is dangerous for us to go on that tangent that mm. infrastructure doesn't matter. Because I think that wasn't the reason why you know, people didn't vote for the president. People appreciate it. And I feel for me, that one thing that worked seriously against the NDC was a very effective propaganda machine of the NPP, you know, fueled by a media conspiracy. I said this, you know, in the morning on another network. And just by this afternoon, I've been proven right because I said it and went further to make other comments. 
in relation to, for example, I was with a colleague on the platform, and he said the NDC lost because of the MPP, that the people voted for the MPP because of NDC's arrogance, corruption, and incompetence. And in response, I said, no, the people didn't vote for the MPP on those bases, because if they were going to vote for the MPP on those bases, then it would have meant that they have forgotten the arrogance, the corruption, and incompetence of the MPP. And went ahead to give examples of the incompetence, like signing a document and coming back to tell all of us it was in Germany and he didn't know what it was, taking us to a hairdresser saloon for a loan. You're talking about arrogance with Dario Kain, who was sacked because he didn't behave well towards a minister. And even when a court reinstated him, the minister said, over my dead body, if you don't apologize to me, you're not going back to work. I said, if people had forgotten those things, then that would be, that would be the only reason why they will vote the NPP. But... The headline on that, you know, network, uh, my join line, is that I said people didn't vote. People didn't vote for us because they are ignorant voters, and it's not because of corruption. And I called the media house and I said, "Aren't I vindicated?" Because that's not what I said. Mm. But that's the headline you have put out there, and so that the is a media that, conspiracy yeah. that people didn't vote NDC because they are ignorant and not because of corruption. I mean, far, far, far from what I said. But that's the media conspiracy for you. They set it up, and then you struggle to defend yourself. Some believe, some will believe you, others won't believe you. And it goes on. And it, it was so calculated that almost every day you had such stories, either online, on radio, or on TV. And you had people in government struggling to always correct those things. But the more they struggled, the more they created more, you know, other issues for them. And then they went back and said, we created the scandals. I'm not saying we didn't create scandals. I'm not saying the party and government too didn't contribute to it. I'm just saying that it was fueled by that effective propaganda machine of the NPP. Why well, can also argue that there was also a persistent... Uh, hammering of uh, propaganda mm. from the NDC side on particular radio stations, Montier Gold, mm -hmm. you know. Could they make the same argument? And yes, what, it, it is be? fair. It yeah. is fair. But you see, the difference, the difference in, 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 in that is, like you have easily identified Gold, Montier, you tune in to listen to them and you know what you are getting. But those pretentious media houses... That posits, like they, they, they position themselves as neutrals. And so they hoodwink a lot of people with, with, with their so-called neutrality. When you as a media, con you know, as somebody in the media, when you can clearly tell when this is propaganda, because maybe you also work in it, and so you know it. But for some reason, there is that cloud of, you know, uh, uh, neutrality around them, and they just push it slowly, slowly, but effectively. So that's the difference. Mm. And I don't blame them. Mm. I don't <laughs> blame the NPP. I think to some extent, as a party and as a government, we, over the years, have spoken so much about it, but we have not really done much when it comes to engaging the media effectively mm. as, as an organization we tend to think that we can always win against them. But I think it will be easier for us moving forward to win with them mm. instead of against them. Mm. And so perhaps we did, because some of the people and some of the media houses may not necessarily be anti-NDC, but they are just comfortable, you know, pushing certain stories because by pushing those stories, they get certain kind of recognitions and pegs. And so... It is, it is more funky to push those stories. And that is why you find a neutral media house, so-called neutral media house, that will tell you that, oh, we review Daily Guide, we review Chronicle, we review Crusading Guide, but as for Palava and Daily Post, we won't. And you ask yourself why. Daily Guide, Crusading Guide, uh, Chronicle are MPP newspapers. So if you are telling me you are neutral, why do you find it comfortable reviewing those? But as for Daily Post, Palava, 
No, they are in DC. <laughs> I didn't know there were stations that deliberately say they won't oh, review yes, certain yeah. purpose. There are stations. Oh, okay. There are stations. If you are advising the NDC that. now, yeah. what, what advice would you give the NDC now after this, after this performance that practically sh is, was a shocking, mm -hmm. you know? I think we should, we should avoid passing the buck, first of all. We should avoid trying to find out who has the most blame because I think there's enough blame for all of us to share. I think this is not the time to, you know, uh, chase each other out of the party. This is the time we all need consolation. Even those who you think are responsible for our defeat are in similar pain, if not worse pain, as you. Mm. And so this is not the time to rub it in the more. Yes, if it's, it's, it's tempting, it's nice, you know, to say, I told you so, there we all are. But to what end? Maybe that would wake them up. You don't need to point it to anybody that we need to wake up at this point. Mm. You don't need to. Mm. We all know what we have done that we shouldn't have done. We all, by this time, if you don't know that there are some things in government and in the party. What, what is what, what, one thing you think you should have done that wasn't done? There were so many things that people took for granted. Like? People, people, I, I, that's what I'm saying. I don't want to go into the specifics. <laughs> I don't want to go into who do... the, yes, yes, yes. But okay. Yes, okay. As, a party, uh... as a party, there are so many things people took for granted. You know, and, and I'm sure that at this stage, Everybody is counting his curses. <laughs> you know, so what we need to do is begin to look at, okay, that aside, how do we come together to ensure that mm. when we have the opportunity, and I'm sure, inshallah, 2020 will have that opportunity again, we don't, you know, do the things that we have done that mm. led us to where we are. I don't think the NPP won the election. I think we dashed them. Because look at the figures. And they speak loudly. Nana Kofado won with his 2012 figures, practically. With his mm, the same mm. results he got in 2012, mm. to a very large extent, is the same results that couldn't win him in 2012 that he used to win. I mean, a little, of nine, a little over 92,000 plus. Mm. And for me, I can attribute it to, you know, uh, the limited registration exercises that we both did. Because obviously, the MPP registered people, NDC registered people that they knew where they are voters. Yes, there may be some devs here and there, you know, that the, and you will have some people crossing over, a few of them crossing to MPP, a few of them coming to NDC. But largely, he maintained his 2012 voters. It's not as if those who voted for the NDC in 2012 have regretted and all M block moved to vote for the NPP. If you look at the figures, you see that in places where the president won by over 70,000 in 2012, he won by about 50,000, mm. and the MPP maintained their figure. Mm. Mm. So it tells you that the people in that constituency didn't get angry with the NDC to the point that they moved to vote for the MPP. They, they simply didn't vote. show up. So now that you are a member of parliament in the minority, <laughs> how do you see your role? Because me. <laughs> <laughs> Because you are riding and hoping that you'll be in the majority. Yeah. And of course, you had, a, you had a very good relationship with the president. So I'm sure you were, or people will be expecting some tailcoat mm -hmm. effect on you. Mm -hmm. That, oh yeah, a man, he's even close to the... <laughs> and you are now in there without that hook. What's your role now? I have the NDC. It's a big family. And it's full of love. It's full of support. And so for me, like I said, after the results were declared, I felt humbled. Mm. And, I mean, people say I have a good relationship with the president. Yes, I do. Uh, I'm close to the family. I was close to Professor Mills and uh, many other, you know, very respectable people in the NDC have looked out for me uh, over the years. And I have seniors like Alban Bagwin and co in parliament, Haruna Idrisu, uh, Inu Safusene, and others, Ayaraga and co are still there. I, I'm looking forward to mentoring from all of them. Mm. And these people that I have mentioned have survived in parliament in opposition, and they have survived in parliament in government. Mm. And so I can't get it wrong with <laughs> such pillars <laughs> around me. So yeah. I, am, I, am, I am disappointed like any other yeah. person would have been in my shoes. But 
I am confident that it's, it's a good way of waking all of us up mm. and, you know, um, perhaps training some of us better. My final question. Um, Nanado is the president now. Technically, so hard to it's, it's, it's like the campaign season has ended. Nanado is the president-elect. How do you see yourself? You, you know that, you know Nanado's manifest, you know what he's want to do. Yeah. What should he expect from you? Are you in the position so you're there to make sure he gets a hard time? Or are you there going to support his agenda? I, I, I think that so far, I must admit, I'm not too impressed. I hope that the game is up a little. I was disappointed in the list that came out uh, as members of the transition team. I'm surprised, however, that the media didn't scrutinize it as they scrutinized President Mohammed's list when he first, you know, came out with his first uh, initial appointments. But that's for another discussion. Again, I've had some inconsistencies. I've heard him say, I'm president for all. I'm going to work with everybody, you know, whether you voted for me or not. And then I've heard him say, uh, I'm going to appoint people who, whose thinking and ideology are aligned to myself and Baumia. And then I, I get confused. I mean, is, is that to say that all Ghanaians, whether they voted for him or not, they are thinking are aligned with him and Baumia? Which one is he going to really work with? Is it the people who think like him and Baumia? Or is the all Ghanaians, whether they voted for him or not? So I still think the platitudes are too many. You know, the rhetorics are too many. Maybe when he settles in, he will watch it and give us one direction. But my intention as a member of parliament is clear. I want to represent the people of Tamale North to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. I know they want effective leadership. They want development. And if the NPP succeeds in bringing them that development, that will be good for Ghana. I mean, who will reject, you know, a situation where we don't have any unemployed, you know, mm -hmm. graduate. Mm -hmm. So I will support any policy like they have promised. If they come up with a policy, that will ensure that by 2020, everybody in Ghana, like they have promised, is employed. You graduate, you have your job, you go to work the following day. I'll support that. I'm looking forward to that. If they come up with that policy of one dam, one village, I, my, I am looking forward to it. I have about eight to nine villages in my constituency, I have Burma, I have Kula, I have uh, uh, Wovoguma, I have Wovau, I, I have Balai. They all will need the dams, you know. So I'm looking forward to it, and I will, I will, I will champion it. I'm looking forward to, you know, the factory in the Sanargo district, you know, and and I will support that. I, I, I will, whatever they will do, if they bring it to Parliament, I'll support that because I want a district, a factory in the Sanargo district because it will create jobs. And so I'm looking forward to that. I mean, the $1 million per constituency, I am already thinking of how my <laughs> constituents and myself can use that $1 million. So I, I am looking forward to help them, you know, to the best of my ability, achieve all these things. I mean, the corporate tax, we are told, will come down to about 20%. I'm waiting for the proposal to come to parliament. I mean, there are a number of them. We are looking at the manifesto. It is for the good of Ghana. If they do it, we all benefit. And so we'll be cooperating with them to ensure that they do it. Put your hands together. <laughs> As I thank you so much, man. I just wanted to have a chat with you and, um, you know, and, 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 and then see, you, see, see what you're thinking and what you'll be doing. And I like what I'm hearing. And uh, after all, it's one Ghana. It's one Ghana. Hey. And... Uh, we want this, gonna, this country to move, and we will move In it. In the right direction. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you so Always much. One more time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's Hassan, Al Hassan Suhini. And uh, well, later on, I told you, uh, George Anda will also be in the house. So you're going to hear from him as well. And then remember this at the end of the day one Ghana. Stick around. We'll be right back.